Thank you. Well, I was, I was given the task to talk about precision medicine and myeloma and challenges in defining an actionable approach. And the key word there will be actionable and sort of I'll walk you through some of the current concepts that are being uh, discussed and debated in this particular regard. Um, let me see. My uh, disclosure, since it's everything turns political in a second, there you go. There we go. So, so if you've seen myeloma has uh, greatly changed over the last several years as survival of patients continues to improve. And this slide from my colleague Shaji Kumar uh, continues to show that if you stratify patients for every you know, five years, we, we see more and more of uh, increased longevity for patients. And this is certainly because of the advent of effective therapeutics. And part of the challenge that we have right now is can we bring together the knowledge that we have about the biology of the disease with additional therapeutic strategies that will help us further push this curve upwards. Up to this point, a lot of this progress um, arguably has been somewhat empirical, and some of the treatments that are, that are uh, being employed, the most effective treatments, do not necessarily target or have been developed because of the underlying biology of the disease or the knowledge about this biology. Uh, but more and more, as we understand the concepts regarding the genesis of myeloma, we hope that that will translate into a reality. Now, So one of the key questions that has to be addressed with any cancer talk that talks about uh, precision medicine is to what extent this cancer is amenable to an uh, approach, for instance, such as imatinib has been used traditionally for the treatment of CML. And uh, so there's a whole range of options. There's an option from tumors being very genomically stable that perhaps could be quite responsive to approaches like this to a lot of the solid tumors on carcinomas when in fact there's such heterogeneity, and we'll talk about this more, that approaches that are simple, one drug approach perhaps won't work. In fact, even when you look at, at uh, CML, there's this, this study that was published uh, now five years ago from a group in China where they actually compare imatinib mesylate not in the chronic phase but in the accelerated phase only to show that stem cell transplant was superior. And what this is telling us is sometimes in these tumors, if you actually try to approach it from a single drug approach and an advanced clonal stage, in fact, we may not have sufficient power to achieve that. Now, we tested this concept in myeloma and published this with our collaborator, Dr. Wee Yu Chang from Singapore, looking at any marker that would tell us about this genomic complexity. And he uh, and his team were able to separate patients in myeloma by the number of DNA rearrangements and, and, and segments that have been gained or lost. So we just arbitrarily created an index that would tell you about this genomic complexity. And the most complex patients are shown by the solid dash bold line, uh, clearly showing that independent of any other marker, myelomas that are more genomically complex, in fact, will tend to have a more aggressive uh, features and, and shorter survival. And you've seen this curve, and I won't dwell much into this, but we now know very, very clearly that uh, myeloma is composed of several uh, subclonal populations. Now, mind you, I'll remind the audience of something. When we talk about this slide, we often say there's subclones that they all have genetic differences. But we don't say enough that they also have some genetic similarities. So that is, when you look at a patient, when you start studying subclones, and if the patient, for instance, has a 414, we know that every single myeloma cell will have a 414. What varies are the secondary or the subclonal changes, such as maybe mutations or small deletions that define the subclonal nature. But the core of the myeloma cell always remains the same, and the same would be true for an 1114 or a hyperdiploid version of multiple myeloma. Now, during my introductory comments, I alluded to the progress that has been made because of this therapeutics, and uh, our, our colleague Larry Boyce from, uh, from Emory has championed this concept of the yin and yang of myeloma. And, and, and how we can use normal plasma cell biology to develop treatments um, and also use genetic knowledge about these clones. So in fact, when we target myeloma with protosome inhibitors, or more recently, as we have learned with immunomodulatory drugs, what we really are doing is we're tripping the myeloma cells because of the normal features of plasma cells, features that are so intrinsic to plasma cells that altering them in some way pharmacologically leads to apoptosis. I mean, the most clear example of this for instance, the use of, of protosomal inhibitors. But the yang would be, how can we target those genetic features that drive myeloma biology? So what we really are looking at is for the Achilles heel of this myeloma cells. Um, and I uh, already alluded to biology, but 
There's a lot of knowledge about myeloma, on which I will, I will uh, delve a little bit further. We know that about half of the myelomas have translocations. We know that there's a series of mutations that we'll discuss. We know there's certain of them that represent progression events. We know, of course, there's other factors, extra genomic, if you may, including immunology as well as microenvironment support, that potentially could help us find uh, the, the sought after Achilles heel of the myeloma cells. Now, with regards to personalized medicine, I, I feel like we do have the genomic landscape of myeloma well defined. There's, there's over a thousand patients that have been sequenced in multiple ways, whether it's through whole genome sequencing or, or, or exome sequencing, where we actually have the information. It's very unlikely at this point that additional uh, uh, large uh, mutations or large fraction of patients with a given mutations uh, will be identified. The key is to put these pieces together. So the key is actually to solve the puzzle. And we know there's some logic behind this biology. We know that the translocations are recurrent. We know that some of those mutations are recurrent. And we would like to know that we're in a future where we actually are just missing the very last pieces of the puzzle. But I would argue that we're probably more towards the, what you see in the figure on the right side, that we know there's mutations. We know about RAS. We know about some of the NF-kappa-B associated mutations. We can't quite put them together yet, but we know there's some, some, some logic uh, to that mutational landscape. So my colleague Keith Stewart has worked uh, with a, uh, an analysis of a mutation panel, and, and it seems like every institution has their own panel, so I'm just going to share some of the data that he and his team have generated, where he's looked at uh, genes that are recurrently mutated in multiple myeloma, and some of them are actionable. For instance, the BRAF, we'll talk more about that. Some of them are specific to the pathway, such as the NF-kappa-B. Um, there are genes that can dictate a resistance to the specific therapeutics, and I won't uh, touch much into that, but as you know, mutations that inactivate cerebellum will result in no response to image. Uh, they actually can do some pseudokaryotyping, looking at copy number, uh, looking at biolytic deletions, et cetera, and so they've studied a, a large cohort of patients with this mutation panel. And uh, with, with some of these panels, you can have very, very deep coverage, so sometimes the coverage can come close to 1,000 lane covers for a specific gene, so, so you can actually start getting down to low frequency of mutations within uh, the, the totality of the myeloma cells. And they have found that 83% of patients have mutations. Now this is above and beyond what we already know about the basic genetic subtypes of multiple myeloma, and they've, they've looked at a number of them, for instance, the BRAF mutations. Using this more um, uh, profound level of sequencing, they find that in 9% of the diagnosis and 18% in the patients that relapse. But there is a problem, this is a big problem. Most mutations in myeloma are subclonal. So, so we have this background of the, the major genetic subtypes of the disease, and we have the secondary mutations, and as is represented here, um, a, a vast majority of patients have some of those mutations only represented in some cells. So even if you had a magic wand that you know you can completely eliminate the, the, the effect of one of those mutations, that would only affect a certain percentage of the cells, and whether that translates into clinical benefit or not remains uh, to be proven. And these are some of the um, uh, mutations that they have shown, but I show you this, this uh, picture to compare patients at time point one and time point two to show that, in fact, some of those mutations can be acquired over time, which is another important aspect as we consider uh, approaches such as personalized medicine, that this is a dynamic process, not a static one, and acquisition of some of those mutations may, in fact, dictate progression through specific therapeutics. Now, um, some of this is actually quite intriguing and promising, and these are slides that I got from, uh, from the uh, group from the University of Arkansas, looking, for instance, at targeting mutations uh, such as the ras raf meg pathway. And these are very common in myeloma. At least 40% of myeloma patients have a mutation that involves the RAS pathway. And based on this, and because of the downstream effect they have on MEC, they've proposed things such as using MEC inhibitors. So this is one particular example of a patient that has a mutation that's uh, resulting, in fact, in an extramedullary deposit of myeloma in the liver that responds after one month therapy of trametinib. Now, this is, again, very, very exciting, very preliminary, but trying to get all this information together would be very useful as we try to uh, design a global approach for myeloma patients. And it may be that perhaps we don't do this uh, late on. We, we should actually do this early on, when patients still have more stable genomes, when perhaps a combination of some of those drugs may provide a greater benefit if we're providing standard of care right from the beginning for myeloma patients. But again, this all needs to be tested.
And there's publications, of course, looking at uh, BRAF inhibitors. This is uh, one example that uh, I got from a, a paper published a couple of years ago of a patient with a BMRAF uh, mutation that actually, uh, with a RAF, uh, BRAF mutation that's treated with bemurafenib, and you know, the patient shows a good clinical response. Not durable yet. This, most of these clinical responses are temporary, but of course, like, if we think about the combinatorial approaches, perhaps it's, this could augment efficacy of current therapeutics. And we have known, for instance, about other mutations, such as mutations of the P53 pathway. Uh, we know, and I show here, that P53 pathway mutations and abnormalities increase over time, and perhaps approaching this, again, from an early phase before the cells are highly resistant to apoptotic signaling might be of benefit. So, so there's approaches such as uh, modulation of levels of proteins of tumor suppressor genes. Selinexor is a great example of this, where this is actually being tested in, in clinical trials already in myeloma, and potentially this could have the capacity to replace some of the loss function associated with the lesion of some of these tumor uh, suppressor genes. Now, uh, these are slides that are 13 years old, and I pulled them out just for this meeting, just sometimes to, to, to say, as the French say, the more things change, sometimes the more they stay the same. When we were starting to think about what specific therapeutics may target some subgroups of myeloma patients, and I just drew the cylinders to say that, you know, I'm going to show conceptually what happens, that if you do have an effective treatment, the cylinders will go down just as a reflection of response. And back then, we were looking primarily at the, at the translocations. And so, so, you know, we were thinking, well, maybe, maybe there's some approaches that will work particularly well for the 414. This is pretty well established now that proteasome inhibitors are essential for the treatment of patients with 414. And uh, not only in induction, but actually during maintenance therapy, the administration of proteasome inhibitors appears to be very important. Now, we thought maybe we could target FGFR3. Of course, that is now known to be an unsuccessful strategy because there may be other genes, perhaps MMSET is more important for the 414, and other groups are working in that regard. And we, like others, engage in the testing of a specific inhibitors of uh, FGFR3, really with no clinical benefit uh, whatsoever. Now, <clears throat> this slides also, again, from 13 years ago. I, we started discussing the idea of some global immunotherapy approaches. Uh, is there a future where perhaps there's so-called extra genomic strategies that would be agnostic to some of those genetic features that are seen in the myeloma plasma cells. And that's why we have all those antibodies sort of at attaching to the surface of cells. And now we know, of course, that we have agents such as daratumumab and delatuzumab, which belong to this broad category of drugs and will be discussed further uh, during this meeting. Now, back then, uh, we had recognized that if you look at the cylinder of the T1114, that the myeloma um, with T1114 is very, very unique. It's probably the, the most unique uh, uh, category of myeloma. Uh, in the olden days, ironically, we thought this was a good prognostic marker, and uh, this was in the days when patients were being treated mostly with melphalan and stem cell transplant. Uh, Shaji Kumar has now shown that, well, the prognosis of myeloma has improved for almost all categories, it hasn't improved as much for the 1114. And in fact, multiple series now seem to show that the 1114 may be an adverse prognostic factor. Now, I'll call your attention to something there. On the lower left part of the panel, you see a myeloma cell that has an 1114. That cell looks different from the usual myeloma cells. That's a cell that has a scant cytoplasm, and it has this lymphoplasmacytic morphology. That is a cell that does not have the same protein challenges that the normal myeloma cells. So, so protein homeostasis, when it comes down to protosome inhibition and uh, perhaps some of the signaling that we disrupt with image, is not going to be as effective in this particular cell. And that is one of the hypotheses that we have that uh, perhaps that's why the T1114 is not enjoying as much of the benefit from the new drugs as some of the older drugs uh, would. In fact, it's interesting because this, this 1114, and this, this has been published and, and extensively shown, these are the myelomas that are the most genomically stable. So if you look at techniques like array CGH, the genome, sometimes in this myelomas, looks almost quite normal, with the exception of, of the translocation. On the top right, we had shown, for instance, that the myelomas with 1114 express CD20, and our colleagues from France have tested this in the form of a clinical trial looking at anti-CD20 antibodies without much clinical success, but, but sort of as a proof of principle of this unique subclassification of myeloma subtypes. And I would remind the audience that about 50% of patients with light-chain amyloidosis have this translocation. About 50% of patients with primary cell leukemia have these translocations. 
And this may be one of the defining uh, genetic events, too, for the, the rarity, the so-called IgM multiple myeloma. So that was back then. Well, now we know that for the 1114, there might be specific uh, therapeutics that are of benefit. And, and the most notable one is venetoclax. So uh, as, as you all know, uh, one of the main uh, signaling pathways for apoptosis in myeloma involves Noxan MCL1. And this is one of the preferred pathways for signaling for plasma cells. But some of them seem to be more dependent on BCL2. And thus, venetoclax seems to be more active in patients where BCL2 is, is one of the pathways for apoptosis. And we now know that this is particularly enriched for patients with 1114 myeloma. It may be beyond that. It may be perhaps other myelomas that have a lymphoid morphology. But, but there's in, incredibly exciting and early clinical trial data showing that venetoclax may be particularly active in the 1114 version of, of myeloma. And as a case in point, I'm showing uh, uh, patients here who have been enrolled in clinical trials with venetoclax and have very profound responses. And, you know, one of these patients uh, 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 from Trita at Mayo who had progressed on every single therapeutic has had a very sustained, uh, uh, complete response associated with single agent venetoclax. It's quite possible that at some point these patients again will develop resistance, but, but would there be a future where a newly diagnosed 1114? in addition to, for instance, VRD, KRD, or what it may be, should be receiving venetoclax right from the get-go. So uh, to conclude, I, 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 I'm going to say that precision medicine in myeloma is still in its infancy. I, I think any e effort to um, uh, understand this better, one of the key aspects is that it needs to consider the basic biology of multiple myeloma. So when I review papers that come to uh, to a journal, for instance, that only talk about mutations but completely disregard translocations or ploidy status, I think that's an incomplete paper. And, and the same is true for the sign uh, approaches, for instance, as could be, could be seen in, in grants. I think one of the things that we most need, and I won't have time to cover during this uh, presentation, is that we urgently need biomarkers to predict response to the different agents. So, for instance, the, the group from Emory is working on biomarkers for venetoclax sensitivity. Um, but nowadays, uh, most of the novel therapeutics are being combined with lenalidomide and dexamethasone, and we sometimes won't know if it's the new agent added to that or, or if, in fact, lenalidomide and dexamethasone is helping to that combination. So knowing that information would seem to me is a very important aspect of personalized medicine. I think I've stressed the point that I think uh, this is going to be likely in combinatorial strategies, and I'm just going to finish with a note of optimism, thinking that the, I think the future is bright for for myeloma patients. So with that, I'm going to conclude. And again, thank you for the invitation. Thank you.